please join me in a really warm virtual welcome for Dr. Iran McGinn. Hi, Iran. Hi, Charlene and Bev and everybody. Hello. Um, welcome on this Friday noon. Um, I do encourage you to switch on cameras so we can see each other and just like feel like we're a community over here. It's nice to, to see other parents being parents. Um, I'm gonna get started here. Oh, great. Thank you very much for those of you switching on camera. It's also just helpful for me to know you know, kind of at what stage of falling asleep are people as I go, and then I know whether I should accelerate or slow down. All right, so I'll, I'll start right off. Helping your child build good habits. The first thing I wanna say is congratulations to you for just making time to think about parenting and to, and to learn more about parenting. Uh, I think it's hard you know, the world is, is pulling us to move very quickly and think about a lot of things. And parenting often happens kind of on, on the side while we're really trying to focus on other things. And I think it's really great that you made time to, to really pay attention to how you're parenting and think about it. Um, and I, I really, I hope that this will help you feel like you're parenting better. You're probably parenting quite well already right? If you're the kind of parent who is making time to listen to somebody else talk about parenting and give you ideas. I do want to say in advance, you know, you, you may or may not agree. It's totally fine. I'm not pretending to have total, uh, you know, a chokehold on truth here. Um, I'm, I'm talking based on research I'm familiar with and some that I've conducted. I'm talking based on my opinions and experiences, but it's, it's completely fine if you don't agree with everything I have to say. And I also want to say that everything I'll, I'll say here is aspirational. I do this as much as I can, as thoughtfully as I can, but it definitely doesn't happen 100% of the time, right? And so the goal is to be a little bit better tomorrow, a little bit smarter than I am today. It's not to suddenly switch to perfect because that's that's an unattainable goal, which which I guess I'll talk about in a minute too, the, the dangers of setting unattainable goals. So welcome, congratulations for being here. Let's get going. <clears throat> I'm gonna start with the, just setting the, the, the context here of, of where we are in terms of the kinds of interactions we're having with our kids. So I think a lot about interactions in terms of how much emotional intensity is in the interaction. Everybody's pretty calm is green. And that's the time when we build relationships with our kids when people are kind of upset uh, or maybe even a lot upset and there's a bigger emotional charge that's when we do supportive interactions and it's it's a slightly different mode and then when people are very upset uh, and potentially in crisis that's when we do crisis intervention and, and the rules are really different at that point we're not talking about that today today we're focusing on times when everybody's pretty calm everybody's pretty happy and fine and you're just thinking how do i help my kid get better, even better. Um, why, why is it even worth thinking about habits? I mean, you came here today, so maybe this is preaching to the choir, but um, habits are incredibly powerful in terms of shaping our lives. Habits are things that we do without thinking. So they don't require a decision. They happen by default. And the more they happen, the more we do them, which means that they can really help us change ourselves really significantly one way or the other. If we have a habit of waking up, going to the bathroom and brushing our teeth, and it's just not something we need to think about and decide every day, uh, then we're going to do it a lot. And our dental health is going to be much better than if it's something we have to decide every time. Like for me, exercise is something I have to decide on, to exercise on my own. I exercise a lot less than I brush my teeth, right? But there's a martial arts class that I go to that I really like. That's a habit. I just put on my shoes and go. I don't really think about it. It's not a decision every single time. And I'm there much more often, right? And so habits are incredibly powerful. If we can delegate important behaviors to, to automatic behavior and not have to decide and think about it every time in advance, where did all the cameras go? I'm not seeing anybody here. Okay, I'm going to start with the bottom line for those of you that only have you know 30 seconds of attention in them or life is very demanding. Here's, here's really the, the takeaway from today. 
the most, by far the most important part of creating a new habit is getting your kid to take the first step in that habit chain. By far, I'll elaborate on this a bunch, but rather than planning for later stages, the most important thing is to have a good start and to actually start. The other kind of take home, I would say, or bottom line here is that the when planning activities to help build a habit, the activities need to be easy, right? Think about it like a ladder. As you're climbing a ladder, the rungs are set apart not very far from one another, right? It's pretty easy to take one step and get a little bit higher than you were before. And if you do that enough times, you end up very, very high, much taller than you would be if you were just standing on the ground, obviously. I have yet to find a ladder that requires people to make enormous leaps and hold on to the next rung and then just pull themselves up, barely making it, and then do another enormous leap. But for some reason, that's how we structure a lot of skills acquisition type activities, right? We, we expect big leaps. We expect enormous effort. Um, and enormous effort is generally not sustainable, right? So if you can make small increments, you can get very, very far. So these are the two takeaways, okay? Uh, the small step, the first step, focus on the first step, and then make sure that you have lots of small steps that you can take later on rather than expecting big leaps. Okay, now the details. Oh, before the details, this is a great book. I don't know the guy personally. He doesn't pay me for saying this. Uh, there are a few good books out there about habits and building habits, but this is a fantastic book. I really very strongly recommend it. Atomic Habits by James Clear. Um, it's also available in audio, really good, written by, uh, uh, narrated by the author, I believe, which is always fun to hear. Okay. In order for you to be able to get your child, to inspire your child to, to build a new habit or a new practice, you have to start from a foundation of a good relationship, right? Any request that you make of your child that is asking your child to, to inconvenience himself or herself, even a little bit on your behalf, relies on having enough goodwill in the relationship. And I really think about relationships like, um, like storage of goodwill. And you can either put goodwill in or take goodwill out of a relationship. And when you have goodwill in the relationship, lots of good things happen as a result. Right, your kid is more trusting of you, is more honest with you, will put more effort into requests that you make, will cooperate with you more. So many good things happen when there's goodwill. Um, I'm not going to spend today talking about how to build goodwill. That's that's kind of a separate session. But the the short version is that if you show your kid that you're, if you show your kid care or respect, you're making a deposit into the relationship. You're increasing the amount of goodwill in the relationship. Very explicitly, uh, showing care and respect, meaning you can say, I care about this, or you can show them that you care about their preferences or about how they're feeling right now. And then the opposite is also true, right? If you show them that you don't care, or if you say, I don't care what you want, or I don't care if that's comfortable or not, or if they set a boundary and you just kind of explode right through it, that's a withdrawal. That takes away goodwill from the relationship. Likewise, when you're asking your child to inconvenience him or herself, that's a withdrawal from the relationship. And it's that's an okay withdrawal. We all ask each other to inconvenience ourselves, right? From past assault to, you know, swing by the dry cleaners to, uh, you know, plan me a birthday trip. Uh, there, there are all kinds of things that we ask each other, ask of each other. And it's okay. It's just important to be mindful not to make so many requests that you end up draining the amount of goodwill that is there. One way to do a quick dipstick test to, to check if, if you're ready relationally to be asking your child to start behaving differently and setting new habits is seeing where you are on this scale of relational, um, relational balance or how much goodwill is in the relationship. So if your child spontaneously goes out of his or her way to be helpful to you, you know, puts your warm, your hot water bottle in bed before you go in and you come back and, you know, the lawn is manicured and so on. This is a very, very high relational balance. Your kid is really trying super hard to, to be good to you. This kind of fantasy level high, but just to 
just to give us an anchor for what very high is like, right? Spontaneously try to make your life better. Median, which is where many of us are when things are going well, you ask your child to do something, your child by and large, you know, 80, 90% of the time says, sure, and just does it, right? Very minimal nudging, very minimal repetition. If your child grumbles, maybe does it, maybe not, maybe you have to nudge multiple times, maybe, you know, your child sometimes just says, no, I don't want to, and just shuts it down completely, then maybe the relationship account balance is low. And it's worth thinking about improving it before you start making more significant demands of the child. And then, of course, if you force your child to do things that your child doesn't want to do, you're essentially withdrawing goodwill that's not existent in the relationship. And you may end up at a place that is the opposite of a high account balance where your child is just sitting there plotting for ways to make you miserable, um, which is nobody's favorite place to be. Okay, so my, my main point here is that as you're thinking about things that you could be suggesting to your child to do, the likelihood that your child will even consider them depends on the strength of your relationship. And the strength of your relationship depends on how much goodwill is in there, how many deposits of goodwill you've made through shows of care and respect, and how cautious you've been about when and how you withdraw goodwill from the relationship. Okay. Here are some ways to fail at building a new habit. If you ask your child to abruptly change his behavior, do something that is really frustrating and unpleasant, and that doesn't feel relevant to your child's goal, it's essentially guaranteed that your child will not develop that habit, right? So if you say, you know, let's start, you know, running five miles every day, run with me, don't fall behind. Um, and your child has zero interest in running or fitness or spending time with you or the outdoors, uh, then it's very unlikely that this is gonna happen any longer than you're willing to force it to happen, right? New habits do stick if progress is slow and incremental. If your child consistently feels successful in trying that new habit, if the activity itself is pleasant, that's even better. And, and if it's relevant to your child's goals, right? So if your child says, uh, I want to learn to cook better, and you say, wonderful, let's work on this. Um, you know, let's start by chopping vegetables. Uh, does that feel relevant? Your child goes, well, yeah, I guess, I guess so. And you might talk for a bit about why it feels relevant. And then you start with again, really simple tasks. That's more skill training, actually. That's not a great example. I apologize. So in, in habit building, maybe the habit that you want to build is adding a vegetable to the meal, adding a vegetable to every meal, right? How can we make it so that it's a slow incremental change that feels pleasant and relevant for the child? If we can do that, that habit is more likely to stick. So I'll, I'll give more examples in a minute. To make a habit relevant, I think the best way to do this is to consult with your child. Talk about why this matters and how this connects to your child's goals. So let's say that your child has a goal. Um, let's say that your child has a goal of saving more allowance money. Let's say you're, you're an allowance kind of family, right? And so your child has a goal of buying a certain toy that your kid really wants or some Xbox game or something like that. Um, and you might say, okay, so you're gonna need X dollars in order to, to get there. Let's talk, you know, and you really want this. Yes, okay, so I have a suggestion for how you could get there pretty quickly. And your child is now interested. And you say, well, he, here's my suggestion. I'm thinking that if you would like to mow the lawn at the neighbor's place, if you would like to, you know, spend less money on sodas at the cafeteria, right, whatever it is uh, that, that you're trying to promote, link it to your kids' goal and desires and explain how it's going to contribute directly to what they care about. If you want your kid to be, if you know that your kid is interested in in getting into a varsity team, if you know that your kid is interested in being part of the band, if you know that your kid is interested in making more friends, right? Whatever it is, think about your kid's goals and then think about how does it link to a habit that 
you want to propose that your kid form. Making the, the habit, making performing the habit pleasant for your kid uh, is also a, a really important aspect of making a habit stick. Um, we had a session like this, I don't know, a couple of months, a few months back when the, hab the habit that the parent was trying to instill in the child was taking off shoes before coming inside because the kid was making the house muddy, right? Like that's, that's an example of a habit that many of us would love for our kids and maybe for our partners and maybe for our guests to do as well, right? So how do we make that rewarding? Um, and it's as simple as praising, praising the activity, right? The behavior, saying, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it, saying, I'm glad you remembered. That was really nice. Something like that can, can make it a big part of what's going to make this behavior successful. Because at the beginning, it requires motivation from you until it becomes automatic, right? Once it clicks and taking off shoes becomes automatic when you get inside and, and it feels weird not to do it, you don't really need a lot of maintenance work. But up to that point, you need to be supporting it yourself. It's very important. Different people have different tolerance for, for failure and for frustration. And you know your, your kid's tolerance for frustration tolerance, for frustration and failure. Some people get very motivated by failing initially. Some people can't tolerate it at all and need to feel very successful immediately. Maybe I should change the wording here, but you, you need to pick a goal that you're sure your child will find motivating. So if you say something like, the goal is to um, practice piano X minutes a day, the number of minutes that you pick needs to be a number of minutes that your child is certain your child can do. It, it can be a very low number. It can be three minutes to begin with, right? It's, it's totally fine. You can build more time. As your child does the thing, finds joy in increasing skill and increasing mastery and improved performance and so on, your child will do more and more of that. If you want your child to uh, to take the dog out for a walk, right, twice a day, every day for the whole week, maybe you start by doing it every Tuesday afternoon and that's it, right? Or only once a day for specific days of the week. You start by something with something that you're sure your child can do. And then you celebrate it and you thank the child and you praise the child, right? As as the behavior begins, you did three minutes of piano. Fantastic. Stop. I'm in the middle of a piece. No, stop. You have to stop. We said only three minutes. It can be like a little bit of a joke if you want it to be, and you can allow the kid to, to go more, but be clear about the fact that you're really asking for something that your kid and you believe your kid can achieve easily. And this, this connects to all the previous parts as well. Start really small. Starts with three minutes of practice piano a day, walking the dog once a day, maybe not walking the dog, maybe your kid's job is to put the leash on the dog and call you over, right? Whatever, whatever it is, starting with something very small that connects the, the trigger with the behavior. Habits in general are about forming this connection in our mind where if this thing happens, then I do this. When I wake up, I brush my teeth. Uh, when I'm done eating, I clear my plate. When I get in the home, I take off my shoes. When it's 3 p.m., I practice piano. When somebody hands me something, I say thank you. These are all if-then kind of triggers, right? And the, the whole point of what we're trying to do here in helping our kids develop a habit is building a very strong, when this happens, I will do this association in our kids' mind and in our kids' behavior. And so this goes back to, to my point about that that first step in the in the footprints in the sand being the most important. If you can link, you know, getting to the beach to taking one step, you're you're halfway done with instilling that new habit. After that, it's just learning to take more steps. But if if your kid wakes up and goes to the bathroom, great start. Then you can start building on what happens once you get to the bathroom. If your kid says, oh, it's 3 p.m., let me go put a leash on the dog. Amazing. 
right? Maybe you take the dog for a walk. Maybe your kid later on will take the dog for a walk, but it's there's there, you're, you're starting to create this automatic association. When this thing happens, when this time comes, I do this. Okay, the things that I would suggest prioritizing with building new habits with your kids. One, and it's kind of num number zero there, uh, it's invisible, is make sure you're in agreement. Make sure you're in alignment with your kid, right? You don't just decide things for your kid most of the time and they do it. Talk it over, think about it together, decide what's the right behavior, what's the right skill or goal we're trying to achieve here, why, how is it contributing to your kid, how is it contributing to you, whatever is the right motivator here, right, and be in alignment, what's the amount that feels very doable and doesn't create any kind of resistance, so on. Okay, once you have all that in place, the most important thing by far, in my opinion, is making sure that the behavior is performed consistently, meaning that when the condition arises, your kid does the behavior. It's 3 p.m., you sit down at the piano. You're done eating, you pick up your plate. What, whatever, whatever is the, you enter home, you take up your shoes. The consistency is critical. Even if you're only doing a small part of that behavior, just having a thing in my mind that goes, oh, it's 3 p.m., uh, half the battle is won when I know something needs to happen at that point. So consistency is critical. Quality of performance, you know, for taking shoes off because it's muddy, there's not a lot of quality, although, I mean, you could argue, right? My kid used to just throw his shoes around the house. That didn't really help. He took them off and then threw them kind of sideways. Uh, whereas now he's, you know, just putting them where, where the shoes stand. That's, it's not a complicated behavior, but there's a quality aspect to it. Um, likewise, you know, if you're practicing piano, it can be kind of throwaway practice or it can be real practice. Um, it's much better to do a little bit and very well and then slowly increase the amount of work that you do. Much better to do it this way than to do a lot very poorly and try to push up the quality over time. Right? That's that's my suggestion to you. I'm happy to talk about it more if you want um, during the Q and A. So the the order of events as you're establishing a new habit would be make sure that you're initiating it consistently, or that your kid is initiating it consistently. Make sure that it's performed very, very well. Even if just a tiny bit of it is performed, make sure it's performed very, very well. And then slowly increase to the amount of uh, amount of behavior that you want, right? Three minutes of excellent piano practice can eventually become 30 minutes of excellent piano practice. Right? But three minutes, 10 minutes of throwaway piano practice is very hard to turn into 10 pianos of high quality piano practice. Okay, general tips, and I think then we're essentially done. One is pick a very clear trigger, right? It's 3 p.m., I'm gonna go do the thing, I'm done eating, I'll go do the thing. I hear the word blah, blah, when somebody says, you know, somebody says I'm really upset, you know, you say, I'm sorry, that's not what I meant. I'm gonna try to, whatever is the trigger and whatever is the behavior, have a very clear if, then. A trigger can be a time, like in the day or the year or, uh, or yeah, what, what time, you all know what time is. It can be a place. When we arrive at a given place, we do something. When we arrive home, when we arrive at school, when we log into a session, when we, whatever it is, specific place. Or it can be an event when something, when a particular thing happens, when the dog barks, when a thing breaks, uh, you know, when, when I accidentally bump somebody and they fall over, whatever it is, right? Time, place, and an event. Second suggestion is choose goals that you can control. Uh, it's very hard to control results, right? To say the goal of this practice, I'll know that I succeeded in my new habit when I can play this piano piece perfectly. That's, it's gonna be very hard to, to figure out what your progress is, and it's gonna be very hard to, to control that outcome. What you can control very easily is how much time you spend practicing or how many times you do a, a, a certain thing, a certain exercise, um, or what's the order of things that you do. These are all things that are under your control. The output is not so much under your control. The input of your behavior is under your control. 
So you might say, I'm going to practice for five minutes every day and let's see how it goes. And after a week, you check again and it turns out you didn't make a lot of progress. Then you can decide, maybe I'll put in 10 minutes. But you can't, it doesn't make much sense to say, my goal is in one month to run a five minute mile. You, you, you can't control that. What you can control is how much you exercise. And then you can check how well it corresponds with you progressing to your ultimate goal. And the last bit is uh, for many habits, it's a good idea to have logging available. Just a simple chart will do. Um, what, what gets monitored gets noticed and gets done. Right. And so your your child may or may not be at the age that is appropriate for gold stars uh, and, and, and care about stickers. But regardless, just having a table that says did it on Tuesday, did it on Wednesday, did it on Thursday, it makes a big psychological impact uh, for, for everybody. Right. For you to see and praise for your child to see and realize, like, I'm, I'm able to do this consistently. And then a couple of the uh, troubleshooting pointers, uh, you're going to slip, of course, and your kid is going to slip, of course, sometimes practice is not going to be perfect, the habit is not going to immediately stick. And it's okay, just kind of shake it off, you know, and, and get back to it. If the goal is three minutes a day, and your kid missed a day yesterday, because of whatever, don't do six minutes today, just do three minutes, right? Because doing six minutes would make it harder. It's more work right? And creates more resistance. The goal is to immediately just get back on track as much as possible. And the last little bit is if you're trying to eliminate a behavior, it's very hard to build a habit to not do something. It's much easier to build a habit that will block the behavior that you're trying to eliminate. So let's say your kid gets in the house and runs with his muddy shoes all over the house and you're trying to teach your kid not to run with his muddy shoes all over the house um it's tough because your kid could be doing any any other things right should your kid walk with his muddy shoes all over the house should your kid walk with his muddy shoes only to the bathroom to wash his hands or like we whereas if you teach take off your shoes you know as soon as you come to the home take off your shoes put them in the in the shoe rack that that block the behavior if your kid is in the habit of throwing a tantrum whenever he's he's losing a board game, right? It's very hard to teach somebody not to throw a tantrum when they're losing a board game, but you can teach other behaviors, right? At the end of a game, no matter the result, you know, we shake hands and say, good game, or we say that was great, or we, you know, ask, do you want to play again? Or we, wh whatever it is, right? You teach a behavior that, makes it harder to do the behavior that doesn't work. Again, ideally in coordination and after consultation with, with your kid. If your kid agrees that that's what your kid wants to do. Okay, summary. Um, new habits stick when you enter into them slowly, when the kid feels successful, when your kid feels that it's pleasant and, and relevant for, the, for your kid's goals, which requires communication in advance with them. It's easier, it'll be easier for your kid to attempt consistently when these habits have a very clear trigger, when they're performed consistently, when the focus is on consistency, connecting the trigger to the behavior, and when you add some sort of tracking system. So even if it's for your kid to self-monitor or for all of you to monitor together. Okay, that's all I have to say about that.